Okay, well, thank you for joining in person here and then to everyone online as well. Um, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Antoine Collins. He is an associate professor at École Pratique des Hautes-Études at uh, Université Paris Saint-Lettre. He is the founder of the Coastal Geoecological Lab, and that's based in Denard in, in Brittany. So Dr. Collin is a geospatial ecologist. He's interested in interactions between coastal social ecological systems. And he's worked at the University of Quebec, at uh, Creobe in French Polynesia, and at Tokyo Tech. So today he's gonna to be talking to us about coral reef spatial resilience and taking a geoecological perspective uh, of coastal risk. Um, so before I hand it over to Antoine, special thanks to Biodiversity Network for organizing this uh, and partnering with Nissan Francais on this to get um, Antoine over here for this talk. Um, so thank you all and go ahead and have fun. Thank you very much, Lisa. So yeah, I'm, I'm very glad to present you and to share with you a warm lecture about the coral reef special resilience. And uh, yeah, thank you to the, the my geoecological viewpoint. We see the geography and the ecological part of that uh, burning issue. So let's go here. The outline of this lecture. Maybe uh, you will do not have the. I don't know about the zoom. Maybe they can see the outline. So we we'll see together the statement. In the coral reefs and maybe coral reef scapes, this is a kind of concept between coral reefs and landscapes, as you can guess. We see how to, uh, nowadays they can they are integrated into a, um, specific ocean climate hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. And these three, com the three components: hazard, exposure, vulnerability, uh, compose the risk. So we we'll see that together. Then we investigate uh, in furthermore the exposure and hazard. And I can present you some of my papers about the bathymetry and habitat mapping using remote sensing from satellite to UAV. And furthermore, we go together to the topo bathymetry, that is to say, the combination of the bathymetry and the topography, which is quite relevant and expected for the coastal reef, as you can get. We see together how we can also map the habitat of the topobiosymmetry of the coastal integrated and seamless uh, viewpoint. And we see the submersion mapping still using remote sensing and also hydrodynamic modeling. Then we'll uh, examine the connectivity part, and I'll show you two studies, one about the special linkages between the humans and coral reefs in Japan, and the second one about the special networks of humans and coral reefs, and here in French Polynesia. Then this is uh, resilience itself, about the adaptive capacity, so which we will see together adaptive capacity is a part of a vulnerability. And we see how to map the social ecological vulnerability in French Polynesia and how to map the spatial temporal resilience in Japan. And finally, we'll finish with a cultural aspect, which is which could be interesting as we are scientists to see how the inductive part, uh, induction dedicated to the art visuals can be a good mediation for uh, coastal reef resilience transferability. So here, the first, we'll sit together and we will have this question, why to map the coral reef resilience? So here, this is a nice picture from an atom in the Tuamotu archipelago in French Polynesia. And you can see on this table here, you have the ocean, which is which was quite flat, but calm. And here you have the lagoon. And in the middle of these two bodies of water, you have small part of low land. And those low land can be vulnerable. But 
can be also resilient if we are able to manage it. So the context, the ocean climate hazard, I will present you the last IPCC, IPCC report uh, for four different factors which are related to the coral reef resilience. And uh, we see that the scenario, which was the SSP5 8.5, so uh, strong gas emission at the end of our century. And uh, the baseline was uh, the average between 1995 and 2014. So here, this is the change in SST, sea surface temperature. And you can see uh, plus four degrees in dark red. Here, this is the change in sea level rise. And you can see more than one meter change in dark yellow. And you have the third here. This is a change in total precipitation with more than 40 to 50 percent of change in dark blue, in dark, in dark, yeah, dark blue. And here, the change in surface wind in dark green with more than 10 percent of change. As we are discussing about the coral reefs, we see the tropical belt. So as you can see for these four different factors from the sea surface temperature to the surface wind, we can see that we have the highest values of, our, of the change value in that tropical belt where we can see the coral reefs. So the coral reefs will be exposed to uh, strong changes. It was the uh, ocean climate hazard. Now the exposure, the exposure can be can be relatively mapped easily using not any topography. So here this is the worldwide topography, and you can see in blue, in light blue, the lowland, and especially in South America, Africa, India. And East Asia and even North Australia. And you cannot see the small islands, but they are also very vulnerable about the topography. In exposure components, we have the topography, but also the population. If you do not have any population, you do not have any risk. It's important to bear in mind. So here, this is the worldwide population density. Here, this is the CD location of the city for more than 1 million population. And the last IPCC report also gave us the change in population density for the end of the century, not, not based in different scenarios about gas emission, but it's only based on change in population density averagely. And you can see on the tropical bed, and we find the coral reefs, but we here have a lot of the population that is really strong in East Asia and East Asia, in Africa as well. And the change will be very important, mostly in Africa, in India, and the change will be lower for the East Asia. So here we will have a burning issue about the population density. Africa and East Asia, as well as the Penan Arabic Peninsula, as you can see. So here you have the Red Sea. So this is the exposure. And now the last component of the risk is vulnerability. And here I will discuss about the adaptive capacity in that vulnerability component. And I will show you some of ecosystems that can be deemed, that can be considered as a real natural barrier. So, of course, the coral reef will be the, which is the subject of this discussion. But in temperate, you may have also oyster reefs and even, even other living reefs. You have the blue carbon ecosystem, sea grasses, salt marshes, mangroves, and they are called blue carbon because of the capability to sequester and store carbon. They can maintain and capture sediment, reduce sedimentary suspension. And even on the upper intertidal area, you have the marine grasses and sand dunes, for example. 
What is very interesting here is that the coral reef can break the wave, can attenuate the significant wave height, so it can really be a good asset to prevent and to mitigate, to adapt to climate change. So all of these ecosystems have to be considered as a real natural barrier. So let's focus on the coral reefs. Coral reef ecosystem, here you can see the, the blue corals, heliopora, and actually these corals can deliver ecosystem services. Now we can, we can uh, speaking about mostly ecosystem contribution, about the provisioning, the regulation, and the culture. So the ecosystem deliver this contribution to coastal cities. And in turn, the coastal cities impact or manage. Actually, they can have some factors which could be resilient or stress factors to coral reef ecosystems. This is, we can say, the adaptive, adaptive life cycle of this social ecological system based on the coral reef. We'll, we'll speak about the coastal protection mostly, that is to say, the regulation contribution. So coral reefs has to be have to be have to be seen as ecosystem engineers because there are main reef buildings. We have the hard corals, the purpose of this lecture, we, which are called Claractinia. But we do not have to forget the coralline red algae as well, because the hard corals are main reef buildings. But the uh, some, some studies and in some areas, more than 50% of the risk is due to the coralline and skeleton. So by depositing and accumulating calcium carbonate dedicated to the substrate, the protective skeleton, coral and algae colonies play a major role in the reef building process. Here you have the Murray Island, and you can see here, this is the volcanic island, the barrier reef, and you may have like a calm, a flat body of water between the ocean and that island. And here you can, you can see some villages along this high volcanic island. So the coral reefs as ecosystem engineer are able to build, to construct specially complex coastal zones. Likely to assimilate the wave energy and flow velocity by exerting a substantial drag and to alleviate inland surges of the coastal reef and subsequent coastal disaster, including destroy, destroyed crop infrastructure and disrupted social network. So, this barrier, this natural barrier, can be seen as a real um, shield, as I to show you. So just to summarize the coastal risk at the end of this introduction, we have the hazard. We we saw something about the submersion, the surge, but also the sea level rise. And we may also have the erosion hazard. We need to have the exposure with the topobasimetry, topography plus basimetry and where we have some population demography. The third component of the risk is the vulnerability, which, is, which can be equal to the sensitivity divided by the adaptive capacity. And so this is a risk uh, combination. We travel together to different uh, study sites. So from uh, my laboratory in Vienna, and Brittany, France. We'll go to French Polynesia, and in French Polynesia, you have different archipelago or sub archipelago the Marquesa Island, the Tuamotu Island, and you have the Society Island. So, with atolls, with high volcanic islands, and with a mix of them. We'll also travel to Mayotte Island in the Indian Ocean. 
and man say archipelago in Japan. So how to map the coastal reef within coral reef case? This is an interesting question. Uh, so I will show you first study about the 3D basic mapping, so for example, from passive satellite. So here uh, we use Sentinel-2, which is a freely available passive satellite. And we use like the four bands at 10 meter per size over one island in Marquesa archipelago, which was called Satuluku in the ocean. So first of all, we had to correct it for the imagery, the land, the clouds, and shadows masking. We correct for the atmosphere. We remove the sun gleam, and then we correct for the hydrosphere. And thanks to that, we are able to derive the bathymetry directly from that sentiment to that bathymetry. We, we can derive strong and satisfactory bathymetry product as soon as we, we can calibrate and validate it. So we here we use a sonar, a simple one sonar, and uh, we apply this uh, empirical ratio transform model, which is quite uh, quite good with 0 0.75. We can say the satisfaction of determination, and following the bathymetry mapping, we were able to classify the bathos using calibration validation, and not from sonar, but here from basic photocrystal there. Long time, 2016. So, and actually, we went to Satsuku because uh, it was in 2016 during the coral bleaching event. As you can see, there is a bleaching part. So, here this is the first study. We can also derive the bathymetry from UAV, which, which is increasingly used today because of. Here we use a consumer grade DJI UAV, which was very interesting for the spatial resolution 0 0.01 meters. And it was still in that situation, but in Uri Island. We applied our RGB based photogrammetry structure from motion. So here this is a mosaic of various RGB, natural color visible imagery derived from the UAV. And we applied the photogram photogrammetry to extract, to build a digital subject model that says bathymetry. Here, this is simply the differences between the our product and the validation MIDAR data set. Then I show you one another one thing, the bathymetry, not from passive satellite, but from a combination of active and passive satellites. So we use very high resolution passive satellite imagery, Pleiad 1, of 0 0.5 meter, and we calibrated, validated the traditional uh, way is what I did in Satuhu that time is to use sonar, but here we use another remote sensing product with the space bomb MIRA which is called ISAT2. So actually, the bathymetry here was, was derived from only phase one product without field work. So the Pleiad 1 imagery can be greatly validated by the ISAT2 LIDAR data. And it was applied in the Indian Ocean, Maya Thailand. So here, this is the natural color visible Pleiad 1 imagery. Here, you have the ISAT2 the ISAT2 transect with the, here you have the transect with different bathymetry measurements derived from space. And you are able to construct to build the regression, non-linear regression between the bathymetry derived from the ratio transform and the bathymetry measurements from the LIDAR satellite. And once you are satisfied with your model, you are able to map the bathymetry. And here, this is the absolute bathymetry derived only from space. Furthermore, once you have the bathymetry, you can derive 
the basic classification. And here we divide it between the red, green, blue, between the three and one, between zero and four meter water depth. Quite good uh, classification accuracy, 96%. And then for deeper water depth, between four meter and 15 meter water depth, we have another accuracy of 96%. Then another interesting study is not to use satellite, but to use airborne uh, LIDAR. So here the pixel size from the density is about 0 0.5 meter pixel size, and we use a UAV as a ground shooting. So we did that study in Murray Island. Here you, you may recognize the auto mosaic based on the UAV. And thanks to this sampling, we were able to classify our ground truth into five coral reef states from, we could say, coral reef health to coral reef sediment. And so it's the kind of gradient of the coral reef. Thanks to the architecture of the neural network modeling, we were able to predict the coral reef state form of these five classes based only on LIDAR data and only two LIDAR predictors, the surface from the LIDAR and the intensity from the LIDAR. Here this is the green intensity. So once we were satisfied of the accuracy of the model, we applied. So here this is the LiDAR surface map, the LiDAR intensity green map. So we applied the neural network model, and we were able to map the coral reef test. For this, I could say for this small study area, but we went further and we applied the spore model as the island state. So here we have the lighter surface model, the lighter intensity ring. We, we use these two predictors as input for our network, our neural network model. So we, are, we were able to classify the four coral reef head states in the area from this blue sand and pavement to the blue patch, which was composed of acropora, which is multipora, multipora, but to say healthy reef, based only on LIDAR survey, airborne LIDAR survey, and airborne UAV ground truth. And uh, another thing is to derive the not the bathymetry as we saw just before, but the topo bathymetry. Because we were discussing about the coastal risk, and as I told you, there are no risks if there are if there's no people. So we had to focus on the topographic side of the coast. And we use the player one again. But here it was to derive not the bathymetry. First time we derived the topography based on the three stereo Pleiad one metry, the point chromatic one, zero point five meter. And following the topography from the three stereo topogrammetry, we derived the bathymetry as we did just before. And then we combine both products, topography and bathymetry, to get the topo bathymetry only from satellite. It was calibrated, validated by institute machine. And uh, we did the same thing, but at higher spatial resolution with another satellite, or G2. At 0 0.3 meters of satellite, we did 16 total spectra, so topo bathymetry, as I told you. And we went further to classify the land and sea, land use and cover, CUC cover, directly on the image. So here you have the land. You have the sea, here you have the topography, the bathymetry, and here you have the classification of the land and the sea with a really, really good uh, overall accuracy of 98%. Now, mapping.
mapping uh, the cost of risk, we use the player one topobathymetry calibrated, validated by sonar in uh, matter in Nangiroa in Pomotu Archipelago. This is the topobathymetry from Totonac. Then we were able to produce an exposure index only based on the elevation and the distance from the shoreline. Then we use wave simulation, so we use an hydrodynamic model to recreate actually waves derived from 1983 Orana cyclone. So we created the simulated cyclone driven wave, and we saw how these waves submerge the lake. So here you have the water attitude problem. And then we were able, because we had the exposure, we had the hazard, so we were able to map the risk. So this is the final things about the hazard exposure risk studies I wanted to show you. Now about the connectivity, how to link and how to network humans and coral risk. So, uh, linking humans and coral reefs, uh, I will show you if there were if there were some differences in the geomorphic parameters of human drilling as a function of a presentation of coral reefs, and if there were some differences in the bay occupancy rate as a function of presentation of coral reefs. And I did that study. I tried to answer the question uh, in Japan. So here, this is the greenish part with the human habitat and the bluish part with the coral reef habitat, coral reef bar. So Nantai Archipelago is the elongated span more than 1,000 kilometers over 41 islands, so from Taiwan to south of so here you have the old here you have Yonaguni, which is the island closest to Taiwan, until Tanegashima, which is a subtropical island. And uh, actually, Tanegashima, this is the island where the Japanese space agency launches its rocket. Why I show you that picture? Because actually, due to the security around the around the, the space. The coral reefs are very well protected. You do not have any fishermen. So, this is a great study area. And uh, I wanted to show you two things. So, here, uh, actually, we counted the number of houses, of course, human houses provided with coral reefs and deprived of coral reef. So in blue, we have the total houses facing coral reef barrier. And in green, we have total houses deprived of coral reef barrier. And we try to see how, on the geomorphic parameters, three geomorphic parameters, the elevation, the slope, and the distance from the shoreline. And actually, you can see that for this three different parameters along the two series, we found that the coastal houses provided with coral reefs were found to lie at significantly lower elevation, significantly more gentle slopes, and significantly shorter distances from the shoreline than the coastal houses directly facing the ocean without coral reefs. This is a trivial observation, so it's quickly proven. And we we saw that the significance of the differences in geomorphic parameters of human dwelling as a function of the population density. And we saw that for the three parameters, elevation, slope, and distance from the shoreline, the statistical magnitude distinguishing the risk from the risk provided to some houses increased with the population density. Another interesting result. Now I wanted to just to, to check if there were some 
interaction between the number of bays along the 41 island, which were only occupied or unoccupied, occupied by at least one person half or unoccupied, so by zero person half. Over the two series, so the bays deprived of a continuous barrier reef, and the bay provided this barrier reef. And then I just summarized the occupied branch system of time by a simple ratio. So I was able to create a bay occupancy rate. And what we saw is that the attractiveness exerted to human dwelling by the reef provided bay was twice higher than the reef and bay. Okay, so this is could be interesting also to see how the bay occupancy rate uh, vary with the latitude. So here you, you have the north latitude and the bay occupancy, reef provided bay occupancy rate. And we over the 41 islands, we investigated the six most populated islands, uh, which represented more than 81% of the archipelago population, and we saw that the reprovided bay occupancy rate increased with the latitude. So with a good relationship, close to 0 0.2, but not very strong, not very satisfactory. However, if we just uh, remove that island, why removing that island? It's called Anami island, Anamishima, and actually this island is featured with high, complex, and deep bays because it's a very young island, so it doesn't have the same pattern, the same history, uh, geological history, compared to the other islands. And if we remove, we could say that outlier, we got a very strong agreement, so to 0 0.96, okay? So the previous relationship was considerably better explained by another line of model. Now the second thing is how to network humans and coral reefs. So here this is Moria Island, uh, Earth Chef Island in French Polynesia. And you can see directly you have two strong bays, two deep bays on the northern part. And here you have the leeward coast and the windward coast. And as you can see on the wind warp coast, where you have a lot of precipitation, the, the bays are much wider compared to the leeward side. So we decided here to classify the urban patches on the terrestrial reef and the coral reef patches, so for the reef barrier mostly. Not the fridging one, but the barrier. And we tried then to we classify them by using an object-based approach. We using segmentation, then object-based decision. And thanks to that, we were able to produce network, graph-based network, linking the urban patches and the coral reef barrier. So we were able to create this kind of network using a freeware and workout. And we found that the um, I could say that uh, two different categories. We have network provided with a continuous barrier risk, and we have network deprived of the continuous barrier risk. So network without continuous barrier risk were underlined on this on this y-axis, on this network identity. And we just measure two parameters, two variables of our network, the depth of the network and the width of the network. And what we can see is that the both depth and width of the network provided with parameters width were very different from the from the, the two parameters of the network provided with the coronavirus. And the network without continuous barrier reefs were significantly deeper and less widespread, which is the first 
of that search finding. And then we try to figure out how elevation influence this relationship. So here we have the same network. So the underlying one corresponding to the network without continuous binary. And the other one corresponding to the network with the continuous binary. And what we saw is that networks without the continuous were provided with urban patches which were significantly higher in terms of elevation. All right, so it's another, we can say, uh, relationship, geomorphic relationship, which can link uh, urban terrestrial patches with the coral marine ecosystem. Now, following the connectivity, we will examine the resilience itself, so how to map the coral reef resilience. Here, I told you that the coral reefs were a combination of the exposure, the hazard, and the vulnerability, and the vulnerability was itself the, the term or the product of the sensitivity divided by the adaptive capacity. So here, we saw uh, that the influence of the coral reef structural complexity and wave size. On y axis, you have the reef growth uh, rate, and on the x axis, you have the structural complexity of the coral reef. And with the gradient color bar, you have the reef health index. So, low reef health index and high reef health index. This is the conceptual function. And then the result, we saw that the structural complexity of coral reefs is more important than sea level rise in determining the coastal protection provided by coral reefs from average waves. And second big conclusion was that a significant increase in average wave time to occur at present sea level if there's a sustained de degradation of static structural complexity. And our model corresponded to the conceptual structure with here the low risk and index and the high risk index. Okay, so now how to map the social ecological vulnerability? We can say how to map the spatial resilience to look in positively. So here this is the conceptual structure with the two sub systems. The ecological one in green, the exposure to the sensitivity, adaptive capacity. And so here we gather the exposure to the adaptive into ecological vulnerability. And then we have the social subsystem with the same parameters and the, the for the social vulnerability. The linkage between the ecological and social subsystems was the delivery of ecosystem services now with the contribution. And the feedback was the use of this services, the use of the contribution. And so we were able to, thanks to this conceptual culture, we were able to map the social ecological vulnerability around rural islands. So in blue, low vulnerability in, in red the high vulnerability. So the first time we when we saw when we presented that to the manager, they were quite happy and, and actually they even if they have good knowledge about the local uh, coral reefs and local use of the social resources. They were very happy to see how to reinforce some of the sectors. Now, how to map the special temporal resilience? So we did that in three steps. The first one is to develop social economic resilience indicators based on two things, the population and the assets. So the assets was the, the price per square meter. And the second one is to develop coral-type ecological resilience. 
So we have our three components, the social one, and the ecological one. And here, what was quite original is to follow, to monitor the evolution of the social ecological resonance over a decade. So we found social component with the asset, the population, and the ecological component with the parasite. Here, briefly, the conceptual flowchart of the resilience mapping was based on a lot of observation data, ground truth, from acoustic, geographic, spectrometry, but also from satellite data, using ocean color model, nighttime information, MSPRS. Natural color visible to be able to derive land use and cover, and even at very high resolution using the garage. We also use tsunami and typhoon databases, recent ones and historical ones. Then we combine, we compile all the this data using numerical and social modeling, and we put the results into landscape resilience model. Then with our two different components, the social, social one, ecological one, over our decade from 2002 to 2007. Okay, so let's have a link on the landscape resilience model. So landscape resilience model, we had the social part, and we had five factors, four straight ones based on the Cyclone storm database, the tsunami database, and the recent one, and the historical one. And we have one resilient factor that says elevation. Higher you are, less vulnerable you are. And this is the ecological part. So here we have six stress factors and six resilient factors from the eating rate. To the protected area, thank you. Okay. And we use actually a sociological, sociologic approach based on a logistic curve fitting, and we apply it to each factor. Okay, so this is for the stress factor for the decreasing logistic curve, for resilient factors for the increasing logistic curve. The coral reef protection was based on the the habitat related drag coefficient. So here we have our result. The time series of the social resilience. And here we have our two different factors of the social resilience, the population and the assets. We, we had the increased social resilience from blue to red for each year of a decade. This is for the social part. And here for the ecological part, we have one map, one vulnerable map or resident map for each year from blue with a low coral resident to red, a high coral protection resident. But here, as you can see, at that regional scale of uh, more than 1,000 kilometers, it was difficult to see the differences in the colors. So we decided the coral reefs area were difficult to discriminate at this region, regional scale. So we were, we, we were motivated to use bubble plot approach, bubble plot visualization. And actually here you have the social resilience in y-axis, the coral protection resilience in X axis, and you have your, the, the yearly results over the decade. So the color corresponds to the membership of the sub archipelago. There were nine sub archipelagos, and the size of the each level, so each level corresponding to one island, and the size of each level here corresponded each server with one island and the size corresponding to the population size. All right. So this is for the social population ecological resilience. And here we have the social 
asset ecological resonance, the difference is the size of each island corresponding here to the asset size and not to the population. So we were about to see the dynamics of our social ecological resilience according if we were investigating the, uh, the population or the asset. It's quite interesting. We can see it's moving. So then uh, strong dynamics over this decade. And if you average uh, the results just to see if there were some pattern. So um, once factors were weighted according to the resilience contribution, sometimes constant patterns arose. A negative correlation between the ecological resilience and the latitude. So the latitude here is correlated with the temperature. The least resilient islands are low lying, so exposed, deprived of wide reef barrier type of natural environment and are located on the eastern and southern boundaries of the archipelago. The southwestern most, middle and north, eastern most islands surprisingly have the same social ecological resilience and the northern the southern most lagoon, which is lagoon close to the Taiwan, have a very high ecological resilience. So according to those results we were able to Create like a map, create a map for management guidance, and so we were able to see which island was the most vulnerable, and so required the most attention from managers and stakeholders. So Kitai, Kitai Jima, compared to Yana Green or Tanegashima, which were very which presented a very high social ecological resonance. Now I will finish with that uh, cultural approach. So how the cultural approach can add in coral risk resilience. So here we see the risk resilience culture using geovisualization. So I speak about culture here, about the, the, the awareness mostly. So how people can be aware of the coastal risk of the exposure to the sea level rise, to the cyclone rise and rise. And here, this visualization, which was only based on satellite imagery, so the Pleiad one uh, from which we derive the topography and the bathymetry, and over which we read the natural color imagery, so that. Uh, Inhabitants, people can see where, where they live and what, where, what is the distance from the shoreline and maybe from the coral reef barrier that can help attenuate the own risk. We did that with a higher uh, satellite imagery, so the world view screen. So here we did the topo bathymetry with the natural color imagery. And we also use the classification to see which are the lenses and cover and to use the cover. We also, it was interesting to see, we, I'm sure maybe you, you know here, maybe uh, the, I'm not sure, but we applied a sandbox. So it's uh, augmented reality. Actually, this is only sand, which is colored like instantly, uh, we can say like in real time, which is colored by a projector. And as soon as you move the sand, it moves the topography and it moves the color. So here you can reconstruct, you can handle your own coastscape, coastal landscape, and you can see, uh, for example, if there's uh, some erosion, if the if the transformation, how it could change in color, and so how it, it could change uh, about the coastal risk. So we did that with the Bachelor of Students. And we can also use in virtual reality. So here, it's not in uh, tropical areas, but it could apply it. It was in Normandy Street, and actually, uh, 
we were able to derive the video. What was interesting about that is that the, this script was based on only like panoramic photographs. And this trick is really like a frequently, frequently used by local people, by the people who live in that street. So when they see that we can simulate such kind of way, they really, it has, it has a great impact of the awareness of the risk. And what is interesting in, our, in, the, in that picture is to see how, for example, the, the wave height or the water height in the, that street can be attenuated, attenuated if we have some healthy coral reefs or not, in, of course, tropical islands. To just make aware people that what they can see here just about the, the water height can be diminished, can be reduced if they protect or if the natural bar barriers are in good place. So here it's me from back and we were in the immersive room, which was quite, quite interesting. And I will finish about the visual art. So yesterday with the with my colleague, we were discussing about maybe a thing which can be a standard or which can share knowledge for the small communities in ocean, I go in Pacific, but also maybe in Indian or Atlantic Ocean. So the small communities can share like three continents and not dichotomic, but continents related to the coral reef case. So the first continuum is from land to sea. The second one is from nature to culture. And the third one is from human to non-human. So here you have some drawings uh, from an artist, uh, which was called imbrication. And you can see directly from that drawing that here you can feel, you can see the, the calmness, the flatness, of the lagoon. So in here, the simple line represents the barrier reef. And you can see that the boat and even some houses on uh, Piper can be, can have their, their place because of the flatness, the calmness of the lagoon due to the barrier reef. And here you can see also with that, in that drawing that the sea the bridge, uh, you can easily feel the, um, how to bridge the sea realm to the land realm, to the territorial realm. And here it's represented, symbolized by the pontoon. So this is this land sea bridge, okay? And here it's uh, quite interesting as well. You can see, you can guess maybe, uh, not really related to the seascape. So this is a drawing from the seascape to the landscape. And this is a territorial object, but drawn from the sea. So once again, it, it echoes with the continuum, continuum between land and sea. Another drawing about imbrication. So about the Polynesian uh, culture. You have the seascape uh, represented here, by, for example, by the eagle ray. Uh, you, you may also add some shares, some coral fish, trigger fish, trumpet fish, etc. Some, some microalgae. And from the seascape, you may also have like human features, like here it's a kind of buoy, fire corals. And it's indicated here with the territorial feature, for example, this grid or this vine. And here, once again, and even the flower, very, very related to Polynesian culture. So the 
this I should say uh, for scientists, maybe it's very complex and for the, the artists, I think so. But in, in one picture, in one view, uh, you can you can be sensitive to this lengthy continuum. Another thing that can be interesting is that maybe it echoes the human, non-human consumer. Here, this is a tiki. So the tiki is a kind of Polynesian deity. And here, the artist wanted to, to see that kind of deity, divinity, uh, is composed of escape, uh, escape animals, like the farmer shark. And even, uh, you can see now, with the, the new people that arrived in Polynesia, this is a Chinese dragon, because we have a, a Chinese uh, people who now live in Polynesia, who have the traveler's tree, etc., etc. So this is, and you have the pineapple, you even have the sea cucumber, so there are a lot of different details, the rockfish, the hidden. So here, this is a land sea continent, but human to non-human continuum and nature to culture continuum in one drawing. Another picture, another drawing is the hook, Polynesian hook, uh, which is quite very renowned in the Polynesian culture, from Hawaii to uh, Eastern Island, Rafaelin, to New Zealand, uh, Aotearoa, and uh, French Polynesia in the middle of that triangle. And you can see the fire corals, the turtle, the shear, you have the ray and the ray. And you even have a broken fiber of the pontoon, certainly, certainly due to storming and rain. You see here the main curve related to a buoy. Etc. Et and you have a surrounding fish. So once again, in one drawing, you we can we can be sensitive to these three continents. And I think sometimes scientists need to to get to have another perspective to to be uh, curious, to be maybe inspired by by the, such kind of I could say summarizing uh, feeling, summarizing approach. So at conclusion, what you see, the coral reef case facing coastal risk, we, we saw that uh, to nowadays uh, due to the ocean climate hazard, we saw that the change in level rise, change in precipitation, change in surface wind, and change in uh, temperature will affect Definitely affecting are affecting coral reef case. So we we saw that from different studies and remote sensing studies, we were able to map the exposure to topographically and through classification, land sea, land use and cover to use cover. We were even able to recreate hazards, cyclone driven waves, and overflow. From this other the historical information and uh, numerical modeling, and we were able to map the submersion. What is interesting here is to put the emphasis on the adaptive capacity that the, that risk, that submersion risk, even the erosion risk, can be strongly and significantly reduced by the presence of the coral reefs. As soon as they are, they have a great ecological integrity. About the connectivity, we saw that there were some linkages between the landscape and seascape, between the human dwellings and coral reefs in Japan. And there were some linkages using a graph-based network approach between landscape and seascape in French Polynesia. About the resilience, so we we show how to quantify the coral reef physical protection from rising waves. 
structural complexity and numerical modeling of the, of the wave height. We saw how to map the social ecological vulnerability in Norea and how to map the spatial temporal resilience of so here is temporal, it's quite interesting for the social ecological system in Japan. So here the spatial temporal resilience is really related to a, a trajectory and maybe uh, also the, the first product is to provide management guidance. And finally, about the culture, we see that the use of the geovisualization, augmented reality, and virtual reality can be a good asset to transfer from scientists to managers, from scientists to students, from um, to uh, the society in general, the awareness of the coastal risk. And then we finally saw that the visual art mediation along the three continuums, so the land sea continuum, the nature culture, and the human monument continuum. And we saw that the, the inductive approach of art can, can be a good summary of that three continuums. And actually, I insisted on the three continuums because the, the coral reef case can, can be sustained, can have the sustainability if the local people, local managers, local scientists are around the same people. So thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank the, the School of Geography and the Environment for invitation, the Oxford Biodiversity Network, and especially the Oxford Cityscape uh, Ecology Lab direct, directed by Lisa Wede, and uh, finally the Maison Française Oxford for the travel. So thanks a lot for your, your attention. Any questions? I don't know. Yeah. I'm just wondering back to the uh, the broad based network um, plot. I think on more. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I was asked how that network was made. So firstly, how did you how did you define yeah, how do you define nodes or reefs, and what are the edges? Okay, the, actually, we first we classify the urban patches from the satellite imagery. So each patch corresponds to a, a classification, and for the so it, you can say each patch each patch can be uh, considered as a node, and for the ecological part. We have the uh, here it was we can say uh, maybe more trivial. We just take a, we just took a segment between what we we saw just in front of each urban uh, each urban community, and we considered that it was the closest coral reef architecture to the the urban patches and I, I, I so that actually i i used to it in another we use that software and we consider that those patches and those patches were uh, just created the network based on the distance and the size of the patches
there are many spiral cuts, spiral ratio transform, I think. I don't know if you know that. It's based on the, normally the algorithm should not be, it was written in the title of the, of the paper, but it's independent uh, from the updated. So it, the depth should not be modified by the basic pressure point. So if you have some trend or if you have some macro AG, the what you get derived from that algorithm should not be influenced by. Uh, and actually here the continent two so we have ten metapixel size. So we assume that for that surface area we have a non-general depth metric, which which could be strong assumption, but then we can which part of the coronavirus area you are studying. And um, that algorithm works very well as soon as you have the water clarity, which allows it. So as soon as you have a, a plume and some turbidity and some chlorophyll, it doesn't work so much. Actually, you can see uh, very easily as soon as you have validation data set. Slider or Thomas or whatever. And you can see that uh, just the, the prediction completely switches from the, from the, the trend. And uh, I mean, just to know that, for example, in Nuria or transfer in Nuria, as soon as you are not in front of a river, you may have a good and strong agreement between that. What you have derived from the passive imagery until uh, 20 meters, 25 meters, what you get. But for example, in the Channel Sea, we, we do the same thing in Britannia. The water is quite clean, it's and dependent on the season. And it's mostly in between 5 and 10 meters, what you get. So, and, but you, you can see it's very, very easily as soon as your validation. The other approach is to use the bio-optical model. You have to derive the absorption, the back filtering coefficient, etc. Et it's a more analytical one. It can be, it can be as good as the empirical one. It is pretty different on which case of water to use. Uh, I want to ask about the fish and the globally in the same time. Because it's interesting here because of the time constraints happen. Uh, and they mentioned that these were uh, found by weighing factors according to their revenue contribution. Uh, so I wondered how you. Um, after the contribution. Yeah, uh, actually, each factor were uh, because it was, uh, it was a bit tricky to combine all the factors according to their values. So we decided just to uh, bound them between zero and one. And so using this study logic. So we, we apply the, the which were considered as stress factors, and here it was actually based on the literature and I guess my categorization. So uh, of course the, the algal competition can be considered as stress factors. And as soon as I categorize this factor as stressful, I apply a decreasing logistic curve and but the linkage between the social factors, either stress or resilience one, with the ecological uh, subsystem, it was the coral reef protection insured, uh, the protection insured by coral reef. And so we put that, uh, it was like, as soon as we had some coral reef, the presence of coral reef, we, we assumed that there were 
some flow attenuation uh, due to the drag, drag ability of polarity to attenuate the weight. But must be the whole, uh, yeah, the that combination was based on a combination of the five social ecological factors and this in euro and one. And here, as you can see, but there are some uh, differences in color. Here, this is the combination of the 12 factors, six stress and six resilience for the ecological part. And actually, because the, the factors was, were firstly bound between zero and one, we were able to combine them using the fuzzy logic You may apply another approach. At that time, I was not the first to, to do that. There was uh, some study in the uh, Red Sea, and uh, actually, they, they applied this kind of study logic to combine a lot of that multi criteria, multi factor approach. And we do not have a lot of uh, different solutions to, to be able to combine. Uh, Factors such as the temperature or algal competition. Yeah. In the table you showed a couple of slides ago, um, you wrote that you got connectivity information from FST. How? how? Connectivity information? Uh, the, yeah, the, yeah on, the, on the connectivity, the source is Modus FST. Yeah. How? How, how so, do I yeah. measure the heating rate? Uh, how how did you get connectivity information from temperature? Uh, actually, I I do not have any connectivity here. It's, uh, 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 I, I I was able to produce the heating rate from the the time the SST time series. Yeah, yeah, it's half. Ah, hey, ah, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, it was like uh, based on hot spot and cold spot. So uh, the SST, you know, according to the time series. I had some hot SST, hot spot for hot SST and cold spot hot SST. For example, if I have a knocking, the time series of the SST will will show you this cold spot along the the year or along the yeah, it was from 2002 to 2012 during winter, uh, and actually then I created a network. Um, from that hot spot or hot spot, according to the distances and the time of the spot. And for me, I assume that that connectivity here uh, it was facilitated. We can say the, the here it was more resilient because actually we had a, the particular shear current. It's a kind of West align current as we as we have the and the atoms solution. The gas stream current which actually not uh, which uh, which makes the temperature lower. And that for me that connectivity of the, Cold temperature, colder temperature, impeded or hindered the the SST to be to create like a scenario to create a scenario of bleaching event. So that, that's why I assume that the, this cold connectivity, so the connectivity between cold spots derived from the SST. Was much more resilient for the pyramid because they, it was like uh, to avoid uh, the possibility of a bleaching event. And it, it was really, really uh, tangible on the SST, like the gold screen. You can see, you can see the gold screen is more like high temperature, and you have the lab radar current, which gets some explosion, which is cold. And here you have the Kuroshio and the Oashio and the lower current. 
which permit to avoid the kind of uh, very high temperature of, of, a, of a certain state. Really, knowledge of the, of the, you know, the regional thing, I could say. Uh, because I spent a couple of weeks uh, on this uh, study, and uh, it was really, uh, yeah. If we have this culture, it could be very interesting to have a regional factor. And here it was for the day, but we could also apply for the night, uh, for the night interaction. Come for the day situation. Yeah. A couple of questions. One of them was, you, you said that the managers were really pleased to receive, the, I think it was yeah. a vulnerability map from Moray. Right? So yeah. I'm just curious as to this one, why yeah. and what did they do? Actually, some of them that, some of them are considered a protected area in Moray. So, and uh, I, I'm sure I will just compile the Pattern, but in some areas, the areas were already protected by the, the scheme, the, the law, legislation. And they were happy to see that it was considered as highly vulnerable. But here it was social ecological one. So I didn't present the social and ecological part. But when they, they were happy, because sometimes some area it was only for the social vulnerability and the ecological was much more resilient. Mm -hmm. So they, they are not with a pile of six persons and so they were happy to concentrate their effort on some part. But um, yeah it was based it was interesting because about the social parts of the interviews and institutions, mm -hmm. which kind of board to use, uh, which systems to practice. And so we we combine it based on thinking about the special temporary residence in Japan, but we combine a lot of different layers. And, and then you may have like some, some trends. Uh, we focus on the that part and that right part. We can see which factors are the most contributing. But here, this is a thick result. Well, my second question is about the VR. It looks like you had a lot of fun with the virtual reality of the inundation modeling. Yeah. And it's one of those things, isn't it, that um, I was thinking of Plymouth where I've noticed people starting to use chalk on the wall to say, this is going to be the sea level in in 50 years in yeah, yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. So that I, I was curious as to how people react to seeing water in their streets. Yeah, um, so really, because it's quite it, shocking, isn't it? And yeah, it, it, it can uh, it can promote it can provoke yeah some bit shock uh, shock behavior, uh, but yeah this was a project actually for the decision makers and for people as well for the inhabitants. But actually some of the decision makers, uh, the just area are 30 centimeters and fifty centimeters at the end of the century. But they do not integrate uh, the tide level, the, the storming event, mm -hmm. and that 50 centimeter additional. And here, we, when we put, uh, actually it was two or the end of the century, and when we put the jet from uh, Emmet, or we were in the inactive room, actually there was, ah yeah, this is nice, this is the street that I have to, to manage. You know, here, maybe this is a, a, we can say, a standard of the environmental issue of the management of the 
environment, which is the the miss the the mismatch between the temporal scale of politician election of five years, ten years, yeah. and here fifteen fifty years. Yeah. And as soon as you you present that, I say, oh, yeah. okay, it can be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. so it can be during my my decision responsibility. Yeah, and just, yeah. but but as you as you underline they say yeah it's better to to present that uh, between scientists, managers and the and decision makers and not to the community it's too early now. Yes, yes. But maybe after when we when we uh, decide to uh, invest some connection invest in some maybe natural uh, based protection, we could then uh, present the difference between with uh, pro natural protection and without to promote actually the, the responsibility. Uh, yeah, yeah um, I think people found that this struggle using maps to communicate inundation risk. You think it'd be obvious, it's very visual. Yeah. And I came across an example the other day where they classified the inundation according to ankle height knee height, waist height, ah. head height, and above head. And as just trying to yeah. get some attention to the issue. Yeah. It's, yeah, uh, the it's, PR, that's great actually. Yeah, and actually you, you leave it. It's like, wow, and you can, um, it made you the noise. If you have some issues, you, you go to the email button and, and you can see, you can just uh, hear the noise of the waves. Put like an alarm, a car, car mm -hmm. alarm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, you really need it. Thank you. One more question. I think we can thank our speaker so much for saying. And um, maybe we can have a couple of drinks and have a quick chat. Yeah. Thank, thank you so you. much for coming. Thank you.